And what it is, so I've used this with um, 13 organizations so far in the last year to try and help them to understand their, their governance structures. And these, so these numbers represent organizations um, that um, has taken part. And you work with the board. So each organization has a board and you get the boards to reflect on how they see their effectiveness. And then you have a conversation with the board. So this is a tool for having a conversation with yourselves about where you are. And so what it starts off, we ask a fundamental questions. Do you have in place a governance dashboard? And the governance dashboard is say, how do you monitor um, and, 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 and assess where you're at? Um, as a board, and not just the board's practice, but the strategic plan and, and, and the delivery. Do you, do you have minutes in place? Do you produce and provide minutes uh, of your board decision making? Do you have in place an annual calendar of when the board is meeting? Do you have a board champion? And this board champion um, isn't someone who's named as Carl Murray, responsible for children and young people, but he's actually a champion of the role he holds as a champion for children and young people within this organization? Or do you have board members who say, I'm the champion for this, and they sit down every week and nothing happens? Do you have in place subcommittees and task groups? Do you delegate to subgroups within your board to get work done, or is it one person who does everything? So this person is what they call the chief cook and bottle washer in the, in, 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 in the government. So it doesn't happen, it's because X, Y, and Z doesn't do it. Personal development plans for board members. To what extent do the boards and the board members really reflect on their own growth as board members? Is there an opportunity for them to think about learning and development? Do board members go off on a training program around board governance, for instance, or, or other aspects of the work? Um, and are they recognized for doing so? What about risk assessments? To what extent are there risk assessments, corporate risk assessments, being undertaken by the board about the business? Um, and which includes continuity planning um, uh, uh, on, on a number of um, fronts. And finally, the question of strategic planning. Does the board organize itself to enable itself to have these away days where you could look at strategic planning? All those questions are raised at the beginning. And it doesn't have to be a full day. It just be a day when you go away. It could be a substantial part of the day where you actually take yourselves away uh, and you reflect on the work. Do you have that in place? So these are the questions. Now, some of the things that's coming back, we ask those questions against three indicators. You have either never considered it. No, this is not in place. You would have considered it, but you haven't done anything about it. And yes, this is firmly in place. So those three areas, I'm just gonna pick up a few of them. You will see that the red spike represents, no, it's not in place. And for governance board dashboard, eight out of the 13 organizations did not have in place a governance dashboard of a form. They didn't see it necessary to actually help them to work out how you monitor progress. Then you then look at the thing about personal development, risk assessments and away days. Seven out of the 13 did not have in place. So we're getting to a position, you've got six that didn't, do, do not have um, um, subcommittees or task groups. Now, when you look at the other side, they've never considered it. You're looking at two, looking at six minutes. Six organizations out of these 13 did not have minutes on their board decision. And five did not think. So it's 11 out of 13 did not either consider having minutes or don't have minutes. And that is fundamental. So straight away, you're beginning to see that there are some concerns around effectiveness and this dashboard allows you this minimum standards allow you to gauge and just using these seven will help the board to move forward i'm going to pause there and we will we could come back to some of these but i'm going to pass it over to deborah and deborah's going to take us through uh, um, um, some more things but for the moment in time this is just a, an intro into some of the features and the factors and some of the minimum standards we should possibly try we could i'm trying to say if we address some of these we could begin to get on that road to an effective board. Deborah, over to you. Okay, thank you. okay so that was, that's really very useful, um, Carl, because it gives us a real overview about 
the whole snapshot around governance and whether people understand what that actually is. So I've just taken it back a couple of steps just to just to ensure that people do understand what is actually what actually is governance. So here we go. So I know that the page looks very full, but these are a couple of quotes that I've taken from uh, the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny and also for, from NCBO, which has a look at what, what is governance? What is it? So good governance enables charities. And so when I talk about charities, it's all nonprofit organisations as well. Um, and it talks about them demonstrated transparency, transparency, accountability, and how they involve key stakeholders in decision making. So that's a, a quote straight from the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny, which you can you know, have a look at and which is very useful too. And also NCBO, wonderful organisation to join. Um, they do have some free resources, but it, you, you get the, the best from them if you actually become a member. And they also have a definition around the governance, what our governance actually stands for and, and describing what trustees do um, and, and what it means to be a trustee. So am I? There we go, so my mouth, the mouse has slipped a bit today. <clears throat> they also emphasize that good governance should happen throughout the organization and that the board is responsible for making sure that good governance happens. And they may rely on different people to govern well as well. So it's not just, it's not just the board. It also involves the staff, any volunteers, advisors, and other stakeholders. So it's not just the board that makes it all happen. Yeah, it's, it has to be a holistic approach to all of it. Okay, so I had then had a look at an example of how is governance implemented? How do we become governed? You know, what is it? So I just took an example. For instance, I said, you know, there's a group that has seven management committee members, elected members. So of those elected members, there has to be at least a chair a treasurer, a secretary, and then other members. Some organizations have a chair and a vice chair, and the vice chair might sort of sit in for the, the vice chair might sit in for the chair in their absence, um, or, you know, if the chair goes off, then at least you've got the vice chair there. Treasurer that always has to be in a secretary. So there should always be at least these three roles, but you can have as many members of you, as you want for your uh, management committee. Okay, so if we have a look at the roles that people take on when they actually take on some of these roles. So the chair, the chairperson, we say chairperson these days, we used to say chairman, but anyway, we say chairperson now, it's more equal. So they're really pivotal, pivotal to the structure of all meetings. And they need to be someone who's really good at facilitating, planning and running meetings. Because after all, they're the ones, you know, they'll open the meeting and they'll close the meeting and they'll ensure that that meeting has a journey and that things are achieved. Like Carl was saying earlier, you know, it's not just a jolly where people go and sit for two hours and meet up with their friends um, and then go home. The chair's responsibility, principal responsibility, is to make sure that things are achieved within that meeting time. There are action points and that, you know, uh, they have a look at um, uh, previous minutes. Uh, they nearly always start the meeting looking at the previous minutes and making sure that actions that they, you know, um, had planned have taken place and if not, why not? So the chair has to be a fairly strong, robust character. So that person will help deal with any differences of opinion and conflicts, because they do happen when you've, you've got a meeting of several people around the table, and make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. So they should be very fair as well. But they have the ultimate responsibility for the board's performance. Uh, and a good chairperson gives strength, strength and support to others whilst being resilient themselves. So it, it needs someone who has a good, strong personality. Okay, like I said, some boards have vice chairs. So these, you know, uh, the vice chair might sit in for the chair while the chair's away. Um, sometimes people will rotate the roles as well, and that varies from organization to organization, okay? And sometimes it's called the chair designate as well. So then the role of a secretary, they take the minutes and they organize the committee members. They arrange and administrate meetings of the board and any subcommittees, some organizations have, um, subcommittees as well. You might have a finance subcommittee that goes off and discusses things around finance. So their role involves practical arrangements for the meeting, 
helping develop the agenda with the chair, ensuring that the agenda and other papers are circulated to all members in good time for the meeting, ensuring that meetings are properly convened, constituted and cure it. Cure it. So that means you have the minimum um, um, amount of people around the table. Because a lot of these are done with voluntary groups and it's people's time, you always have to have a quora, so your minimum quora. So they may be that you always say, well, look, we can't hold a meeting. Our minimum quora is five. So if it goes below that, we can't hold that meeting. Yeah, so that's our minimum quora. So that's the secretary's responsibility to make sure there's always a minimum amount of people around the table. We also have to provide trustees with any additional information in order to facilitate any decision making including them informing them of their powers and duties under the governing document. And all organizations have governing documents. And if you, if you are a trustee or you're thinking of taking on trustees, you should always make sure that all the trustees know what the governing document looks like. Yeah, what is it? What's in it? What have I signed up to? So yeah, that's really important. They confirm any decisions, they draft minutes, and they monitor the implementation of trustees' decisions, so make sure any extra points really do happen. And they may write letters you know, um, arising from committee meetings, okay? So then we also have the treasurer. So the treasurer is a non-profit uh, treasurer, so a, a charity or a non-profit group treasurer, and it's the lead board director of financial management and oversight. So in other words, they have oversight for the finances that are coming through that organization. Sometimes they may be the one who's responsible for opening the bank account, they manage the cash flow, and they reconcile bank statements. Um, they also look at um, ensuring the organization's solvency around finance, okay? And give tips and, 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 and um, good practice. So the characteristics of a good treasurer, be capable of handling finance uh, figures and cash, finances, have an orderly mind and methodical way of thinking, have experience in dealing with large sums of money and budgets, hopefully that's all coming through the organization, have experience of financial control and budgeting, and have a really good eye for detail. Now sometimes they also have to be available, <coughs> excuse me, for ad hoc advice. So someone might be putting together a funding application. They may say, right, I'm going to contact my treasurer just to get some information about how I can make this budget really robust and really attractive and value for money for the funder. So it should be someone who's hopefully able to be contacted on an ad hoc basis to have a look at a budget that's coming through um, that might need um, reviewing. And like I said, making um, really, you know, look like good value for money to the funder. And the treasurer is also responsible for applying policies and procedures in timely handling processing and deposit of cash receipts and disbursements and that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's around money. And then there's committee members. So when I say et cetera, that's committee members. And their role is to participate at meetings and offer help and support to any tasks. It might be tasks around HR, you know, it might be tasks around training. So hopefully they're bringing some of those skill sets to the table so that they can offer those um, tasks as well and support for them. Okay, and just make sure that everything is carried out effectively. So then I also sort of, you know, looking at this organization, sort of said that they're elected on a three-year rolling basis. So sometimes some organizations might have committee members that have been there for years and years and years, but really it is better if committee members are refreshed because they bring, you know, new people bring along fresh blood and fresh ideas and fresh and new ways of looking at things. So it is actually quite nice to have that organic freshness coming into the organization. It's like a refresh of what's going on. So the ideal is around three years and um, you should refresh your trustee members. It is better too. And like I said, every time a new person comes in, make sure they understand what the constitution is for that particular organization and, and give them an induction. Um, so they understand what the organization is all about. Sometimes, in the past, I've known some organizations who may have people that they know, you know, it's friends of theirs, they say, oh, I think you'd be good as a treasurer, you may be good as a chair. But sometimes that's not always the best because you've got to look at what skill set has that person got and what are they bringing to the table? You know, what have they got that they can bring that's fresh and new 
and you know good at getting on with people there's all those other things you've got to look for as well so sometimes it's better to pick people who are maybe you know who are not friends because it's you're, you should be looking at I think their skill set what are they bringing to the table and what can they offer this organization okay so and then this just talks a little bit around best practice and duty of care okay okay so then I looked at leadership governance leadership two terms that get often spoken about and of course every non-profit organization is headed by an effective board which Carl spoke about that provides strategic leadership with the aims and values of that particular organization so it's, it's really crucial that anyone that takes on a trustee role or if you're thinking of um, taking on some trustees that they understand what your organization is about what is your mission statement what's your aim what is the value what is that organization in business for what is your business what is your core business okay and then this just has a look at some of the key outcomes um, that trustees should be aware of because it is about collective responsibility for ensuring that the organization has clear and a relevant set of aims okay like i said vision mission and values okay so we're going to stop now for a task now we have popped this also in the chat room so what we're going to do we're going to pop everybody into groups into little breakout groups and have a discussion around governance and i want people to have a look at what they think makes good governance so what is your experience of board members trustees management committees and we're looking for the good practice and not so good practice okay so because we all learn from that too we also learn from when people say well actually you know we had some people who you know sat on it for 20 um stop share and i will start share <laughs> um hopefully uh, what i want to do i'm going to remind ourselves of one of the earlier slides that i showed because i think it perhaps underpins some of the feedback we we're receiving is this question around what is what is governance and i repeat that phrase corporate governance is a system by which companies are directed and controlled and i think one of the things that's coming through the feedback and that's coming through experience and especially when we're talking about people's um how would you say commitment and the recruitment of committed individuals is there is, and this is me talking, not any uh, Obele or anybody else. This is born out of my experiences and working both as board member, as a board member, and working with boards over many years. There is a sense in which the charitable sector, the social enterprise sector, has a persona of being lax, unprofessional, and anything goes. And therein lies a challenge because you're trying to get people on board to give it the professionalism and the, and the look. But there is this undercurrent that says, but you're not serious. It's if you say to someone, oh, I work in the voluntary sector, it means, oh, I don't get paid. It doesn't mean you don't get paid and work in the voluntary sector doesn't necessarily mean free. It, and there is a challenge. It's not us around the table. There's a challenge generally around the sector. And I think that doesn't help because we do not see the sector as having a corporate, a corporate presence. And we equate corporate presence with effectiveness. And therefore, if it doesn't have that corporate presence, it can't be effective. And so we tend to get in that pool people who I'll do your favor. Yeah, I know you want to do something good in the community, but yeah, I mean, um, I, I'll, I'll, be a, I'll, I'll be a registrant. I'll be a name on your thing just to help you going out. And therein lies part of the churn. So I go back to that because when we then come fast forward and, and reflect on some of the things coming out of the feedback and some of the things around some of the characteristics that I think um, some of you um, reported back on, I think they could be captured in some of these bullets. So these are some general characteristics of an effective board. Most, most of which you will recognize from your feedback. 
Minutes are non-existent. They're either late or they're just badly worded. There is a mistake often is that we think that minutes mean, means verbatim, um, verb verbatim wordings um, and written stuff. Minutes are not verbatim text. No one has stenographers um, to create verbatim. And the other challenge to that is if you then believe that you need to capture everything and you record it, you're gonna have difficulty transcribing the recording. So what happens is the recording stacks up. And so you might be able to reflect on it. So there's a balance to be struck. So minutes are not necessarily about verbatim and that's key. You need minutes of key decision about something. So working and, and there are training around minute taking. And so it doesn't become daunting. So you don't have to capture everything. You just need to capture the core. In, insurance and certificates are out of date or haven't been reviewed. And this is, a, this, is, this is one of those things about the dashboard I talked about earlier. If a board was to actually check through on a list have we got this periodically whenever it's due? You will know if it's out of date or not because you're keeping on top of it. So it doesn't have to be every day. It just needs to be done at a structured and reviewed period because insurance are usually 12 months. So if you take it out on the first of one month and 12 months later at the end of that month, you will be due. So you could timetable it in. And if you have a calendar of events, you could say on this account, we're gonna check these things. So there's a lot of stuff um, boards can do to make it easier on themselves. Papers tabled infrequently or not at all. How often do we get papers? Oh, by the way, here are the, um, the minutes from the last four meetings. And there's a whole wadge of papers and you've got um, three minutes to read it or you get it the night before. Depending, I was with a school governing body for seven years and we used to get, for anyone who's been on a school board, who's a member of a trustee of a school uh, on, on a board of governors would know that you get papers at a rate of knots. The amount of trees that gets killed for a board meeting is crazy. You get technical papers from the local authorities. You get papers, I used to be with the Church of England school. You get papers from the, um, for us, it was the LDBS, the London Board of Diocesan School, Board for Schools. And then you'll get the, the reports from their teacher. And some, in some cases, you're to have 30 pages worth of documents you've got to read ahead of that board meeting. And to get that the day before it does not work. And that's just an example, that's an extreme end. Cover up of information by executive officer interfering with the flow of information. What this means is that what you're getting is instead of, and, the, and this is about the relationship between the executive officer, call it a CEO, call it a coordinator, call it a director, whatever title they've got, and the, the, the strategic board. That relationship needs to be clear. Sometimes you get animosity between the board and the functional operational um, team personified by the ed. And then what happens is, there is sort of a, a playing off and that doesn't go well, go down well. I've seen it um, in, in the past, inadequate system of processes I've talked about, meetings canceled at the last minute. Oh, we can't make it, can't, we're gonna cancel it. Or somebody who they think needs to be there can't make it, so you cancel the meeting because of an individual. It's the board, remember it's the corporate the board is not an individual, the, court, the board is a body. And that's the important thing. And it's the body that interact, is the body that's had the commitment, not the individual. And so if you have systems in place, the board can function. But if you allow the individual on the board to dictate the board, the board body cannot function. And it's the tail wagging the dog. And so um, there are certain key things about the board's understanding. Guidelines about responsibilities, we've spoken about that into a relationship, but also within the board, as Deborah said, what are the role between your secretary, your treasurer, your, um, your, your chair or vice chair, whatever title you've got. Those three honorary positions are critical. They're not the only one, but if a board exists and you have transaction business to conduct, one way of building 
um, people around you who can be committed is to have task groups or subcommittees. That is, uh, that's an easy win because it does two things. One, you delegate and you give responsibility to a board member to chair one of those task groups. So they have to step up. They get an empowered, they're committed because they are responsible for that. It's, it, it rise or fall on their head because they're chairing it, they're facilitating it. If it doesn't happen, it reflects on them. No two ways around it. But importantly, those subcommittees can have people on them that are not board members. And this is the mistake that a lot of boards make. They say, we don't have enough people to sit on subcommittees. No, your terms of reference for subcommittees will dictate the work the subcommittees do and the powers it has. If it doesn't have a decision-making power, that subcommittee can co-opt anybody outside of the organization who could lend themselves to support the organization. And so some of your skilled people outside of the organization could work on subcommittees because they have the skill set that you want. They will also begin to see if the body is what they want to buy into. If they like it, they will become members of the board. And so we've got to think creatively, how do we build um, uh, um, some sort of like um, um, support? You could put an advert out and if they had the aura about what you're about, you ain't going to get them. But if you have a subtask group that only meets for one off, I need an HR specialist. We have this problem. I know somebody who's an HR specialist. Let's see if they could give me two hours of their time to help work through this. If they like the way you work and you feed that back, I bet you that person will be interested in turning up again and again. That's how you build your strength. You build it from what the board needs, not what the individual needs. And I mean, I can't say it any stronger than that because I think that's where a lot of the organization I've seen fall flat. Um, finally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this because you will get this. And, and I talked about poor decision-making and decision-making processes. We've all agreed, hands up. And then you hear rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb. And what happens is people around the table, especially if it's a large table, oh, I didn't say that, I didn't say that. Where'd that come from? And you say to someone, well, say something. No, 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 I keep going, I keep going, I keep going. And then it finishes. And after the meeting, oh, I didn't agree with that one. And you hear that quite a lot. So if you're having a decision making, you've got minutes. At the end of every minute, try or every item, sorry on your agenda, try and decide if the item is for information or if the item is for decision. And that's a small trick that anybody could do. Agenda setting is critical to decision-making. How many time we spend time talking about the color of a car or the color of a chair or whether or not this chair should have four legs or three legs. It doesn't matter, sit on the floor, make a decision. And some of those things is, there's a chair over there we're going to buy, this is for information. You don't need a debate about, because you're sitting on the floor, you need a chair. Buy the chair, decide, give them the information. You need to make a decision about a 10,000 pound grant that's come in. And you've got to make a decision on whether you accept it or not, or whether or not you apply for it in the first instance. Let's go back to that point. Why do we have it? What do we do with it? Why should we go for it? Why shouldn't we go with it? That's decision making. Make it clear. This is the decision. This is for information. And the information, you don't have to dwell on it. Let them read it. Focus on the priorities prioritize on the agenda. Don't add the frivolous stuff first because you're gonna spend all your time on it. Guarantee you, if you put on an agenda, um, evening meal out, that's gonna take up three quarters of the meeting. I like to go down this road, no, I don't wanna know. Oh. Leave it to the end, put it at the end. It's not critical to the organization. So agenda setting, prioritizing on the agenda is critical.
I'm going to stop there because I, you know, I just want to uh, um, engage in a dialogue and then we can then pick up um, things. So I hope I give you a sense of some of the things and reinforcement of some of the stuff you're saying and possibly a few ideas uh, along the way. Um, and so we'll open it up for some further conversation, but I'll pass over to Deborah and she could take us through that next step. Thanks. Thanks, Carl. It's wonderful. Okay. Okay, here we go. Good. Okay, wonderful. So let's just. Okay, so how do you source trustees? Okay, so there are several ways. However, this is a, a particular way. There's an organization called Repurpose, uh, and it's an initiative that matches senior executive volunteers with small charity community projects and social enterprises in urgent need of strategic support. Now, you can, um, as most of you are on the MEL program, you can actually speak to your uh, um, MEL consultant to actually refer you to Repurpose. And I believe the turnaround time for getting matched or somebody getting back to you anyway is around, I think, two to three weeks, something like that. So if you just speak to your male consultant um, about and just say you'd like to be referred because you'd like to, you know, have a look at um, the processes around sourcing some trustees for your organization. Um, there's a small application that you'll be required to fill in. Again, you can do this through um, your Ubele male consultant and it just has very basic information, your name of your organization, you know, um, number of paid staff, if you have any trustees and volunteers, whether you've received any funding, do you have a volunteer policy? Some very basic questions. Um, you know, and are you looking for trustees? And if yes, specify. So you may be looking for a treasurer, you may be looking for someone who has skills to help you get some funding in. Um, you may have, you know, your, your HR policies they need rewriting. So you want someone with maybe a HR background. Um, you may want someone who can support you with IT and digital. Um, even making management decisions. So you're looking for a particular skill set. So have a look at what you have and what you think may be missing and what you think may um, you know, bring more to the table for your particular organization. So it's a very good um, uh, application form. It also has around coaching and advice as well and diversity and inclusion. So again, the trustees role, I just put some information up about what trustees have to do. And those of you who've been trustees, I'm sure, You'll be aware of all of this, you know, act in your charity or nonprofit organization's best interest. Because like Carl said, it's not about the individual, it's about the organization as a holistic whole. Uh, manage the charity's resources responsibly. That's really very important. Um, act with reasonable care and skill. That's always what you're driving at. You just want quality, just quality to come from your trustees. To deal with any conflicts of interest, because they happen. Let's be honest, we're all human. They happen, but deal with it. And like I said, you're there for the organization, not for yourself. So, you know, sometimes you, you deal with those things and then you leave them outside the door because you're there in the best interest of that organization. And that's what you're bringing to the table. Implement financial controls. So that's important too. know what you have coming in, know what you have coming out. Balance those books. It's really, really important that you balance those books. Manage any risks, because they do happen. Um, quite often on, again, I'm putting my funders hat on, but you know, a fundraising hat on. Quite often fund uh, funding organizations ask, what are your three major risks? So you need to be aware of what they could be. So if all your trustees were to leave, that's a risk <laughs> and you have none. So that's a risk. So it's all those sorts of things. Um, you need to get more funding in because you know one of your funding sources has dried up. Again, that's a risk. Yeah, so you've got to be able to manage those and always be where you where possible a step ahead of what that risk could be. OK, and, to, you know, like Carl said, to take appropriate advice when you need to. Um, it says here, for example, when buying or selling land, but, you know, take the advice. If you need the advice around HR processes, take the advice. OK, so that a lot of that came from the Charity Commission of England Wales. It's a huge document. So uh, if you want to read that at any time, that's available on the gov.uk website. So what I also thought would be useful is how many people have ever done a skills audit of their trustees? Do they know what the, what the trustees are bringing to the table? It's really important to know. So here's a form that's available. And you, these notes will be available for you after the 
after this presentation, so you can just download this. But this comes from an organization called Trustee Works, for instance, and it just has a whole list of skills. So if you give this to your trustees, you know, the, you know they can tick the boxes and say what they um, have and then what they might need training in. So it's a really, really, really good skills audit. And you should do this annually, definitely with your trustees, just have a look at what have they got and what do they feel they could benefit from. So yeah, just get them to tick through these boxes. Um, it also has a box around motivation. Do you have a particular interest for wanting to be with this particular organization? If so, what is it? So somebody might like animals and be care concerned about the welfare of animals. So they may say, well, look, you know, the reason why I want to join your board is because I, I have an interest in the welfare of animals. Um, again, we spoke earlier about boards being diverse. It's really important because it reflects the delivery of an organization's mission. So always ensure where possible, you have a range of ages, backgrounds, genders, you know, it just brings more to the table. Okay, and then it's got a question around areas of work as well. Okay, so I'm at the stage where if there's any questions that people want to ask, um, Carl, I don't know if you feel you, or if you've got, I don't know if you've got any more slides to share, but we're now up to a Q&A point and we've got about, I think, seven or eight minutes to be able to answer some questions if people want to do that. So it'd be useful if you maybe pop some questions in the chat or the Q&A. We have a Q&A, no, we've got a chat. So, or if people want to ask questions live, quite happy with that too. Carl, you're on mute. Carl, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry, my mouth's moving and nothing's coming out. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I, I picked up a few questions from earlier chats. If I just go I'll quickly go into one of them where somebody said, um, I think it's Kirit. Uh, I, I think you may have just left. Um, he said, we're in the process of recruiting more trustees. Um, I, although he said this is up, I, I'm picking up from some of the conversations um around recruitment of trustees and i know you just talked about repurpose um yeah. deborah and i just wondered um if the question of recruiting trustees is 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 a question we could pick up oh sorry so how how to how to recruit trustees um I, i'm just wondering if there's anybody else it's a general question because oh, okay. is, is, um, i just wondered if there's anyone on on the line who has that question in themselves how do i recruit how do we recruit um trustees and i just want to tease i want to say is it a valid question to ask and to answer or is there another one okay so anybody out there that has I, I, I saw a thumbs up from shami uh, i suppose uh, i i was just yeah. gonna uh just gonna pop in for a minute um okay. i think that in my experience after having worked with a lot of groups i think that a formal process uh, can easily be implemented uh, doing the doing up a, a what I'll call a job description and uh, terms of reference and then trying to circulate amongst people and letting these trustees know that there's a time commitment to the work that they need to do and also that there's a skill requirement it's not just their commitment to the community. And I think that formal process helps because then you can get a bunch of people and not really interview them, but maybe invite them to a social or something that your organization is doing so that you talk through and they ask questions. And then at the end of the day, you then say that this person is okay or this person is not okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think that's definitely. Okay, Gina has offered advertise through doit.org yeah, uh, on the chat as another form. Um, yeah. I mean, there, is, there are um, headhunters um, around trusteeships. Mm -hmm. and there are people who actually do recruitment, and I think they're one of them as well as repurpose. So um, if people are generally wanting, utilizing some of the experience that Ade has just alluded to with um, Gina as a um, and indicated and as Deborah into the repurpose as examples of areas. The other area around recruitment is that, you know, 
and so you know. It, mostly it happens in America as, as opposed to here in the UK. When you're selling a house, you have these open houses. It's only in recent time it's become something popular in the, in, in, in the UK. But you have open house quite a lot in the US where your house is open for a day or two and people just wander in and look around. In a way, recruitment and recruitment of trustees could benefit from something like that, where you could have a, 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 a time and set aside, I don't call it, I don't know how you want to call it, um, but the principle and the concept of someone coming in and learning about what you do and, and, and offer and just inviting people just to hear about what you do, how you do things, because it's about value and worth. Mm -hmm. If you think it's not valuable or worthy of your time to go to a open house to buy a house, you just bypass it and do something else. If you think it's worth your while, you'll go in. And I think um, the organization needs to sell itself mm -hmm. to prospective trustees. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to be a member of the trust uh, of the board? Why would I? I became a member of my, my children's school because two of my children were attending the school. My two nieces and nephews were attending the school. I had a whole family for over five, gen three generations um, going through the school. So I was there for 12 years. And there was an investment of me being on the board because the children were coming through systematically. And so it made sense. So if I want to get involved with Annie's project or Dawn's project or whoever else's project on the line and Naomi's project and so on, sell it to me. Mm -hmm. Why should I be involved? Sell it to me. Mm -hmm. Find a way, the same way you'd, um, you'd buy a house, you look into it, you, you invest, invest in it. Mm -hmm. If you get the right people, it will do great wonders to your organization. So invest in time. Yeah. Just a, 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 a We've little got a thing. Couple of hand, I think Shamim raised her hand. I think Annie raised her hand as well. Shamim, do you want to be Thank in the yeah. speak just quite brief? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very, very new and uh, it's been very informative. Just some of my people are coming in through my business anyway, you know, it's a fitness business I run. And um, but then some of them don't have the skills, I feel, you know, to do the job of a trustee. But they're very, very keen. So is it the skills important or their loyalty to the business, would you say? I think it's a bit of both and it's a balance. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it depends on who. Um, and, and people say, I mean, there was something that just and volunteers will come in and they'll set up. Well, don't worry about that. If somebody comes in and, and poach an idea and go away, it's at the end of the day, you can't stop them. So don't worry about something like that. Whilst they're with you for the moment, what are they doing? And so the skill that they bring is the skill the organization needs. That's the first thing you've got to work out. What is the organization about and what's the thing that you, you want? People walk in and walk out of our lives for whatever reason, and they'll do the same for a board. So, but whilst they're there, what can they contribute? And how, how is the, what I call mutuality of benefits? Um, and because that's what it is, the relationship has to be mutual. And what tends to happen sometimes, we talk about aging, and we also talk about um, longevity or people sitting on the board um, and sort of withering away. Two sides to that. The longer the organization has been in place and it's not functioning, and people are sitting there, the harder it is to move them. Yeah. And so what you've got to try and do is to find, if you're, especially if you're new, find to make sure that you don't have positions that are in perpetuity because you'll get long livers and, and you're going to struggle. The organization will struggle. So look at your constitution. Does your constitution allow um, consecutive cycles of certain positions or are they renewable at um, thing? use those as live opportunities because it will keep people on their toes. So things like that, you can make some changes to. And so, yes, if people are interested and they have the skill set, but the other key thing is if the board put in place certain things, even before the person comes on board, it means they don't have to start from scratch. And quite often, some people are deterred because they think it's heavy lifting to start with, and they'd rather not do the heavy lifting. And that's why I'm saying, try and find things that isn't onerous, take your time and systematically do it, because as you go on, people want success. 
let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Success breeds success. Mm -hmm. And people like to be part of a moving train. They don't want to be sitting in a train standing at the, at the platform. Mm -hmm. If they see the train moving, they're going to run to get on it. Mm -hmm. If it's moving fast, that's too late. Mm -hmm. So they're watching. And that's why I'm talking about our open hours, because if you want them early, there is some things we've done and there's a gap. Mm. We would help. We would like for you to help us to fill that gap. If you're selling it that we're brand new, we haven't got a clue what we're doing, you're not going to get anyone. Mm. So what are we selling? Mm -hmm. I hope that's helps you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So Annie, did you have a question? I don't know if Annie had a question. We have to wrap up shortly. Did Annie have a question? Um, I did, but... Um... It's been answered oh, now. That's wonderful. But thank okay. you for for remembering. That's okay. And Dawn, I saw Dawn had her hand up at one point, or is she satisfied as well? Has her question also been answered? Yeah, no, no. It was. I guess it was just about the hand holding side of it, but it was partly it was partly answered by just. Uh, I think Carl was talking about sort of the documentation that might be available. It's just more. I think some of the the the, the community groups that we've worked with and some of the CICs, you know, part of the problem was either just to help because they're so busy doing just to help with fundraising like filling out funding application understanding how that's that works and whether there is a program whereby you know like some like the arts council has some something where you know if you're if you have dyslexia then there's someone available that you can talk to explain what you're doing and then they'll just kind of do the form for you they take what you've said and do the form for you i think there are a lot of people that have that that's that's kind of one of the barriers to funding is trying to understand the terminology and the sort of nuance of the funding bid but they're also quite long and I just wondered if that is something that Bailey or someone else kind of offers as a as a as an option for small smaller sort of community run organizations um just in the same way that you've put these links up which is really good I just wondered if there is anything like that over to Carl. Um, <laughs> the Mel program, <laughs> assistance the Mel and the Marley program, haven't they? Yeah, I think one of the things that we're looking at is um, is tools and templates, for want of a better phrase. Uh, and I know different associates um, that we're working with um, have their own um, way of working and access to resources. Um, I think there's two things um, within Ubele. There is a, a range of people who can pinpoint you um, at a Gina, Deborah, myself, Steve, and, and so on. Um, and, and, and we all have um, at our fingertips a range of resources. I think one of the things that we're trying to pull together is that uh, through these webinars, are a series of um, opportunities, information, and resources that um, will become live through this overarching capacity framework. But at the moment in time, um, those sort of inroads and support to yourself exist in a, in a variety of forms, either one-to-one. -one. I think if you were to just to contact anyone in Ubele and ask, um, um, is there a template on um, audit trail or a template on minute taking and that, we could find it and let you have that. Um, so I, I think just recognizing that we could point you in the right direction. Um, the other side to that is whether or not we could do it for you it's, it's, an, it's the next challenge, not you personally, but the individuals is the next challenge, but we can certainly point in the right direction. Okay, 